Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for coming to the inaugural Evolution Medicine Conference. Um, as you can imagine, putting on one of these uh, conferences is uh, a huge uh, ordeal. And I uh, want to first, of course, thank you for coming, but thank a few key people who have organized and moved mountains to, to put this together. Uh, first, of course, is uh, uh, none other than Devyani Kamdar, the Executive Director of the Palo Alto Institute. Thank you. Uh, uh, second is somebody who's not here, but a sponsor to Chair of Neurology, Frank Longo. And uh, third is Will Edwards, the uh, founder of Palo Alto Investors. And of course, thank you to all our speakers who have flown from all around the country to be here. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time, but introduce uh, one of the co-hosts, uh, Jun Yoon. Thank you, Charlie. And I'd also like to add to his welcome to all of you. Thank you for all the esteemed guests for being here and for all of your, all of your participants. Uh, and this work could not have been possible without the support of Stanford University. So I would like to also like to thank Stanford. And I'd like to also find out more about all of you. Uh, first of all, a ground rule. We know this conference is about you. Therefore, these phones that you all have I'd encourage you to take it out and use it during the conference. We know you're all busy. The only ground rule is let's turn the ringers off. And if during the course of the conference you have questions, you can even text me and I'll funnel your questions to the panel moderator. So my cell phone is 387-6667. That's 387-6667. So I'd love to learn more about all of you. How many people here work in the healthcare industry? Okay, about half of you. How many people here are in the practice of healthcare? Okay, about a third of you. How many people here consider healthcare one of the most important priorities in your life? Okay, pretty much all of you. So healthcare is a very important topic to all of us and yet it remains a grand riddle. You know, we are basically healthy until we're not. The treatments work until they don't. And we live until we die. We're going to look back at this age as the Stone Age. We all know that. And yet we're, we know we're also living in the age of modern medicine. When I was in medical school, I was inspired by one of my mentors who told me, this is Dr. Charles Putman, who was vice chancellor of Duke University. He said, by the end of your career, Half the things we, have, we will have taught you will have been proven wrong. So I asked him, well, which half is that? <laughs> and thus began the journey to figure out, is there a way to figure out what parts of medicine can be improved? And it requires a lot of critical thinking. And I turned to evolution as a source for wisdom in trying to think through what are the ways we can improve healthcare? I believe evolution is the transformative framework to help us understand disease, health, and wellness. And that's what we're going to be all talking about today. Now, I want to start with a story. When my son, Jeremy, was just old enough to walk and start talking, I learned a lot of things from him. I started to realize, here I am thinking, I'm going to teach him about the world. And instead, what was happening was he would walk around the block with me, and he'd start pointing out things that I couldn't see anymore. A mailbox, a flower. I mean, I've walked the block a thousand times. But every time I walked with him, he was showing me things. And it made me wonder what that was all about. Uh, I'm going to show you a picture that I took. Um, 
this literally was the first month that I had bought a digital camera, so this is going back many years. And there's a photo taken here right near Tressler Union on, on Stanford campus. And it's my son Jeremy, and it's my father, Sung Hee Yoon, who's also in the audience today. And it made me think of the John Milton quote, childhood shows the man as morning shows the day. And I was trying to understand what this meant. We all know we're wiser than children, and yet we also know children can see things that we can no longer see. To exemplify this, I want to just do a quick experiment with all of you. And some of you have seen this before, so um, if you've done this exercise before, just play along with us. I would like to ask all of you to do something that's very straightforward and obvious. I would like you to count the number of Fs that's in this one sentence. It's a scientific sentence. Read it from front to back. Don't read it twice. Don't read it backwards. Just read it front to back. And all you got to do is count the number of Fs in this one sentence. You guys all ready? Don't look at me so that I know that you're all done. Okay, how many people saw all three? Turns out most of you. Bernie, you saw four. Anybody else see four? Okay, a couple of you saw four. Anybody see five? Okay, a number of you saw five. And the answer, of course, is six. So let's try that again. I'm going to show you the same slide. Now that you know the answer, see if you can count the number of Fs in the sense. Five winged flies, that's two, are the result of, that's three, years of, that's four, scientific, that's five, study combined with the experience of, that's six. So here we are assuming we're wise to the world and yet it is fooling us. This notion really caught my attention because this, if you show this slide to a group of children, they'll count all six. They'll see all six. And we know this about children. When we're young, we're able to see the world. We're able to learn about things. We're able to learn a new language. We're able to learn how to play piano. We're able to learn how to skate or ski. And yet, if you're exposed to the same skill sets after reaching puberty, after the age of about 10, we will never own those skills. We're gonna, we can fake it. We can fake how to ski. We can fake how to skate. We can fake a foreign language, probably speak with an accent, but we will never truly be available to those things. And it turns out this problem is not unique to humans. If you look at songbirds, you can take a songbird from Marin County and move them over to Berkeley. And if you take them at a young enough age, they can learn the Berkeley repertoire. But if you take them over after they hit reproductive maturity, they can sing everything they've been practicing perfectly, but they can't learn those new songs. So the question is, why would nature have endowed in us this two-phase life history? A period when we're open to things, ideas, skills, and period where we're very good at executing on what we learn, but we're not truly open anymore. So the way to think about that is, we land on this planet, the average lifespan for humans was in the 20s for a long period of time until recent history, and the idea of spending about 10 years being open to the world and the idea of spending 10 years executing upon what you learned was pretty balanced. It was rational. But in the modern world, something's happened. We're no longer dying at 25. We're living though 70, 80, 90, 100 plus years old. And yet we live in the time capsule of the first 12 years of our lives. Our preferences, our allegiances, our ideology, so much of it is forged early. There's some room for flexible change later, but by and large, so many things get fixed very early on. Now, I would consider this a maladaptation. Why? Because we're living so much longer. Wouldn't it be great if we could stay open to the world for far longer? The second problem is, whereas in the old age, the world you're born into is the world you're going to die in, meaning nothing ever changed. But in the modern world, the world is changing constantly. 
In fact, the rate of change is only accelerating. So the world that we all deconstructed when we're young is no longer even relevant today. We're struggling with new technologies, iPhones, so many more things that we got to incorporate for, and yet the mindset that we're endowed with from a Darwinian perspective is inflexibility, less flexibility after the age of 12. So this introduces the notion of Darwinian dysfunction, which is one of the many things we're going to talk about today. And it shows you the power of evolutionary thinking in the way we interact with the world. I and mean, something as simple as, once you have that notion, you realize, hmm, that explains why teenagers act like they know it all. Because they're supposed to know it all by the time they hit reproductive maturity. And yet we know they know nothing, which is why we keep them under house arrest until they're through secondary school, and then we let them off. But this phenomenon that's been known for years, the fact that teenagers act like they know it all and they stop listening to us, is actually a Darwinian programming. And it's now dysfunctional in the modern world. So this shows you the power of evolutionary thinking, but also is an invitation for all of us to have an open frame of mind today, because we're going to be exposed to lots of ideas. They're going to be provocative. Uh, we're getting in at the ground level of an incredible movement founded by a group of scientists, uh, many of whom are here today, uh, to share their work. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Sloan Wilson, esteemed evolutionary biologist who germinated this whole idea to come up here and say a few words about the proceedings today and also to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you. What a great, great introduction, a great friendly storytelling um, introduction. Um, I like to say that there's three waves of evolutionary thought. The first wave is the one we all know about, a theory that's organized the whole study of life and is taught in biology departments and colleges and universities around the world. The second wave is evolution in relation to human affairs, the fact that the same theory that explains the rest of life can also explain the nature of our species, not just our bodies, but also our minds and our societies and our cultures. Uh, this is something which, of course, has a long history that begins with Darwin. Darwin actually commenced both ways at once. But for complex reasons, uh, a time lag has become introduced so that uh, the study of uh, spe uh, humans from an evolutionary perspective is not in most colleges and universities. It became taboo in many respects uh, during uh, the uh, 20th century, and only in the late part of the 20th century did we begin to once again rethink all of the human-related disciplines from an evolutionary uh, perspective. And so one of the things that's in progress is how can we teach evolution across the curriculum in, in uh, colleges and universities um, uh, world, worldwide? This is something that's not being done. If you're not a biology student, uh, biology major, you were unlikely to get much evolutionary training in today's higher education, not just in America, but uh, worldwide. The third wave is to use evolution in a practical sense to actually improve the quality of life. And the idea of using evolution as a public policy tool is even more new and in the future just getting going than in higher education. And I have been privileged to take part in all three waves. I'm trained as an evolutionary biologist, so I'm trained in the first wave. And um, I'm lucky to have, uh, I've, throughout my career, I've studied uh, all sorts of non-humans, beetles, fish, cool animals like, like that, along with many of my colleagues here, including many of my colleagues who will be speaking here on the stage who are now studying evolutionary medicine in humans, began their careers, and in some cases continue their careers, adding to the study of non um, human species, and to have become interested in uh, the study of humans from an evolutionary uh, perspective uh, at the time that it was just being revived by Edward O. Wilson in 1975, his book Sociobiology, which was treated as a triumph for the study of all non-human species, and then that final chapter on humans created such a scandal for those of us that remember that. I thought that was the year I got my degree. And so that excited me, and I've been studying students, uh, including topics such as religion from an evolutionary perspective. And then the third wave to actually take this powerful theory and to use it as a practical toolkit for improving the quality of our lives at all levels, including our physical bodies, which will be much the discussion today, our behaviors, which will always be, also be much in discussion today, our social lives, and then the large-scale human constructions that we build for ourselves, our cities, 
our economies, our international relations, so human life at a scale that never existed until about 13,000 years ago before the advent of agriculture. All of these approached with the same powerful theory that has already proven itself in the biological um, in the biological sciences. And so when we look at the future and the half of the stuff that we know and the half of the stuff that we, that we don't know, I think that what the future will tell us, we'll look back and we'll decide that in just the same way as that we, we, everyone needs physics and chemistry in order to build the physical infrastructure of our lives, uh, we need evolution in order to manage the living infrastructure of our lives. And, and evolution will become as universally accepted for the same reason that physics and chemistry is accepted. Not because they're supported by mountains of facts, because that's true for all of those sciences. It's because they're so eminently useful. And over the last five years, I've been lucky to be participating in that third wave, putting evolution to use in everyday life through the Evolution Institute, the first think tank for formulating public policy from an evolutionary perspective. And it was through that vehicle that I met June, and we started to talk about our common interests and led to this, um, this um, workshop. Well, uh, Randy Nessie is a fellow traveler. He is of my vintage in terms of age. Um, and uh, as an undergraduate student at Carleton uh, College, uh, he became interested in why we age, the paradox of aging as an undergraduate student. And he carried that interest into his medical training as he became trained as a MD and a psychiatrist. And unusually, I think, for um, um, someone on that track, remained engaged and inquiring in an academic sense about the concept of aging plus much else, and even contributed to the academic literature on aging. And that qualified him to start a remarkable partnership with one of the great evolutionary biologists of the 20th century, George C. Williams. And for them to basically rethink the concept of medicine from an evolutionary perspective. This led to a very influential paper called The Dawn of Darwinian Medicine, and a book, How We Get Sick, Why We Get Sick, and a distinguished career leading up to the present day in which he is a true pioneer of the concept of evolutionary uh, medicine. And so when June and I got together and said, well, what are we gonna do? Randy was the first person we thought we would engage, and then the three of us worked together to bring the distinguished group of people um, to, uh, to, uh, together. And so in one way, Randy is a co-conspirator for this event, but in another way, we are honoring him for his contributions to this field that we are going to be discussing uh, today. Now, this meeting is... Um, Notable, I think, in two other respects. It's not just another meeting on evolutionary medicine because the people in this room are um, members of the private sector, they're social entrepreneurs, they're CEOs of companies, they are, they are uh, um, uh, thought leaders, and they're in a position to do things, to implement these ideas in a way that the academics really are unfamiliar with. And so this is a meeting of two worlds, and what comes of it, uh, we don't know. We don't have a specific agenda. Uh, all we want to do is to talk and to get things going, and then, uh, and then uh, we're going to see what, um, what um, emerges. But uh, so the, the, the combination of the academic side of this with the, with the um, entrepreneurship side of this is a very exciting blend, and uh, I can speak for myself, and I'm so excited to learn about this other world that I've, I've been introduced to through uh, June, and to see what chemistry uh, results from that. And then finally, uh, the um, audience attending this, who just came to listen, includes very, very distinguished people on both sides. There's plenty of people in the audience that, that um, deserve to be on stage. So this is a very distinguished um, audience and a very interdisciplinary audience, and so that's why we have provided as much time as possible for conversation. We're keeping the uh, the main talks short. There's much to say, but uh, a lot of it's going to come out 
in conversation. And in my role as moderator and our other moderators, we're gonna we're gonna try to keep that strict so that we can actually get that conversation flowing. That goes for myself, and so without further ado, let me introduce Randy Nessie for um, giving the uh, first talk. Randy. Thank you. 